Welcome back to another episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst, and today's guest is Dr. Julie Smith. Dr. Julie has been a clinical psychologist for over a decade who uses her social media platform of nearly 4 million people to inspire her audience to help manage their stress, anxiety, mental health, and more. She is also the author of the new book, Why Has Nobody Told Me This Before?, which is an absolute masterclass on how to harness the power of your mind, emotions, and mental health to become a better version of yourself. So Dr. Julie, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. It's really great to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to, to dive into your work. I'm excited to dive into your thought process behind the book. So your book is called, Why Has Nobody Told Me This Before? So I guess my question around that is what's the most common thing that you've gotten in your clinical practice? Maybe it's on social media where you've posted something or you've talked to somebody about a certain thing about mental health and somebody has said, why has nobody told me this before? Oh, well, I guess there's so many in terms of because we've done such a variety of uh, sort of videos and stuff online. And um, but really, the sort of why has nobody told me this before came out of the people from therapy that when I was working um, as a clinical psychologist offering therapy, that people in therapy, once they had a bit of that educational stuff where they learned a bit about how the mind works and how they can influence their mood that was when people were saying variations of why has nobody told me this before? If I'd have learned this as a kid, I would have been, you know, much better equipped to deal with my life. And often it's about things like realizing that not only are your emotions connected to your behavior, so what you do or you don't do and how you treat your body and the sorts of things you give your attention to and how you speak to yourself in your mind, but that that's also a two way thing. So that, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff online about, you know, if you, you just, you just talk positive to yourself and everything will be all right. And, you know, that kind of thing, but actually your emotions also influence the types of thoughts you get. So you can't choose what thoughts pop into your head, but you can choose how you respond to them. So when, if you're, um, if you're not feeling so good, let's say you, you sort of struggling with depression, or maybe you're just low in mood that day, or you're high in stress, you're more likely to have thoughts that aren't going to help you, you know, you're more likely to have those um, catastrophizing type thoughts, if you're anxious, or you're more likely to have, you know, much more sort of negative or hopeless thoughts, if you're low in mood, and they're just more likely to appear, you're more vulnerable to them, you're not necessarily choosing them, that the choice comes after they're there, how you respond to them. So then, you know, a lot of people would kind of would have been really sort of getting themselves down about, oh, you know, I just think negatively and, and it's my fault and that, you know, I, I shouldn't be doing that. And they, they almost sort of punish themselves or get down on themselves for the fact that they think in a certain way because there's this narrative that we're just choosing all our thoughts. Um, and once they realize that I'm just more vulnerable to those thoughts when I feel down, so they're more likely to appear, but it's not my fault that they appear. The bit I get to choose then is what I do next. Uh, things like that, where people found that quite empowering because then they didn't have to, you know, just attack themselves for having the wrong thoughts. They could just work on what came next and how they responded to those thoughts. One of the things I talk about a lot in this really aligns with what you just said is that when you're feeling in a dark place or you're feeling anxious, depressed, super stressed, whatever, like it's not falling into that shame cycle and being like, oh my gosh, like why am I having these feelings or am I the only one who's experiencing this? And then what ends up happening when you do fall into that cycle is a bad day turns into a bad couple of days, turns into a bad week, bad few weeks. So I know in your book, you talk about like the dark, the dark place, like somebody who's experiencing this time of darkness in their life. Like what are some of the tools that you think people can get out of your book? What are some of the tools that you think people can use so that if they are in that dark place or talking down to themselves, they just had something unfortunate happen. They can get out of it in a way that's not only going to like move them through it in a way that's healthy, but it's going to allow them to practice getting better at it for the next time. I think one of the really sort of simple ways of doing that and something I introduced in the book, um, it is, uh, I call it the hot cross bun actually, but you just kind of put a cross on a piece of paper and you've got then got four boxes. And if you write emotion in one of those boxes, you write thoughts in another, you write behavior in another and physical state in the other one. So you've got those four things. You know that it's really hard to just choose your emotions directly, right? If, if for whatever reason you're, you're feeling down, you're struggling with low mood, it's really hard to just decide to be happy. And if I guess if it was that easy, I would be out of a job for a start. But um, we know that the other three 
squares in that equation impact on emotions. So all of those things in that square influence each other so closely that they're like weaves in a basket. So if if you want to influence how you feel and begin to change how you feel, you use those other three boxes. So what you're thinking or how you're responding to your thoughts and where you're focusing your attention, what you're doing or not doing and how you're treating your body. Those three things, if you start to make changes in those boxes, will influence how you feel to some degree. So And you can go for quite sort of, if you want a quick fix, so if you want something that will just give you a little shift now, for example, then it can be something like using the power of physical movement. So that can be really, really powerful. It has an immediate impact, but also a longer term impact. So, um, you know, exercise of some form, um, but it doesn't have to be, you know, doing something that that feels intimidating or boring or whatever it is. Find something you enjoy, you know, stick some music on and dance around the house if that helps you know those sorts of things because you're getting the benefit of two things there you've got the physical movement but you've also got the power of music which which a carefully chosen track can be incredibly powerful at shifting mood very quickly um so again choose the track very carefully because it can also um compound whatever you're feeling you know it can uh, sort of if you're feeling sad if you put on a sad track that can kind of um you know really release that sadness which can be a good thing but if you're looking for a, a shift in mood then something different would help um and then you've also got your sort of your um thought processes so you know if you're having lots of um negative thoughts or hopeless type thoughts um you can learn skills to get some distance from those to begin with so you can't stop them from arriving but what you can do is see them for what they are. So you can you can notice um, in the book, I, I kind of list lots of the thought biases that tend to crop up uh, with things like low mood and anxiety. And there's things that we all do because they're part of being human, but we tend to do more of them. We're more vulnerable to them when we're not doing so good. So if you can kind of go through each of those and learn what they are and and then you can kind of notice them. So one of them is um, all or nothing thinking. Some people call it black and white thinking. And it's this kind of polarized thinking. So um, either I get 100% in my test or I'm a complete failure. It's that kind of all or nothing thing. And that really compounds um, sort of strong emotional states because it invites us to be, we're either just enough or everything's terrible. And and so those sorts of biases are thoughts that can arrive naturally, but then they're only going to make your mood worse. They're going to make it harder to function. But what we can do is respond to them. So we can notice and learn to, or practice picking up on them. Oh, okay. That was a, that was an all or nothing type thought. And just by doing that, just by picking up on no, seeing a thought for what it is, which is a bias and one possible way of looking at something, you've already given yourself just enough distance to to not take it on as one complete fact or one the only truth available to you. And that gives gives you the chance to take some of the power out of that thought because it, it, the power of any thought is in how much we take it on and buy into it, right? So, you know, if I tell myself a failure and then I believe that that must be true because I've thought it, it's going to really massively impact how I feel. Whereas if I have that thought and then I notice, wow, all that self-criticism is really coming on today and and that's going to make me feel worse. You haven't stopped yourself from being self-critical. You've noticed what it is. You've seen it for what it is, an old habit. And then you can shift to a different perspective. You've opened up the chance to think of something in a new way. I love how you you put that. And you put it kind of very simply for people to be able to take action and use these situations that they find themselves in, in a way that can be used to form new habits. That can be a way to, um, kind of go down the route of having a growth mindset and also like just give people grace and knowing that like life's not always going to be perfect. Right. And if you have some of these thoughts, it's completely normal based on a situation, but here's how we're going to get out of that in order to prevent us from making choices that are going to further us down that path of the bad day. Um, there's a lot of like talk in the self-help space right right now as far as like uh, about habits and things you can do to prevent yourself from having a bad day, for, to prevent yourself from being in a bad mood. Like in your clinical practice and what you've seen as a clinician, what are some of the things that the people can can kind of do or not do to prepare themselves to to not have as bad of a day um, as they can? Uh, I think 
first of all, is accepting that that some days aren't going to be the good days, that mood, normal mood fluctuates up and down to a degree. But what we can do is is take care of certain things that increase the chance of having a good day. So um, the first and foremost, you know, that's something that I always go through people, probably no matter what, is, what, what we're tackling in therapy, is making sure the person is aware of what the foundations for good mental health really are. And, you know, we talk about having a sort of physical health immune system. And, and in some ways, I think of it a bit as a bit like that, that there are certain basics, certain foundations, that if you take care of them, they act as your defense players. So, you know, um, if you I, I often think of it as a kind of football terms, if you don't want a goal scored against you, you need some pretty good defense players in line to reduce the chances of that happening and it's the same in life so the, the defense is that I would um kind of create a, a list of um and sometimes I tell people to do this as well you know you get a little post-it note or something and um you write these things down and then you stick it somewhere that that you know you'll find it so that you can kind of check in with them each day but it's uh sleep nutritional intake uh routine social contact and exercise so those five things are key defenses and they are what people would call the basics right they're the things that we say yeah I do that anyway I'm kind I'm fine I'm fairly healthy and and yet they're the first things that we let slide if we're not doing so good because they're the things that we don't necessarily see as non-negotiable you know if I haven't got time I won't exercise or if I got you know lots going on then I won't go to sleep and and all that kind of thing and the thing is, I mean, I don't care who who you take on this earth. If you take anyone and you start messing around with those five defences, that person will become vulnerable to becoming unwell physically and mentally. So those, you know, those those basics need to be constantly. You don't have to do them perfectly. You don't have to have the best sleep routine and the best exercise routine and the best diet. You need to just keep keep them on your radar. So when I say about the kind of post-it note in the wardrobe thing is just check in with them on a regular basis and say, what's one thing I could do today and tomorrow that would just pick those up a bit? You know, that what's one way that I can improve my nutritional intake today? Could I, you know, add in some veg to my dinner or, you know, could I do some exercise even when I wasn't planning on those kind of things. And it's just always checking on how can I redirect and come back to looking after those foundations because those sorts of things are key for prevention and they're going to increase the chances that tomorrow will be a better day or that you'll be more able to cope with whatever life throws at you. You touched on something, Dr. Julie, that I think a lot of people tend to struggle with and that is kind of throwing things to the wayside that improve their mental health when they get overwhelmed, when they get stressed, when they get busy. And it's like the very thing they want in that moment is to get through the stress and be happy, but they're not utilizing the things that can actually help them get closer to that point. So I want to dive into that a little bit more. So I know you have a book out, you're a mom, you have a business, you have an online community that you're trying to manage. You have a lot going on and I'm sure you get overwhelmed and stressed and super busy at times. So when you're in those moments, what are some tips that you use for yourself to make sure that you're continuing to put yourself in front of everything else, like mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, so that you can continue with that routine to become a better version of yourself. Yeah, well, um, something that I I do and have included in the book actually is uh, something I call values check ins. So um, you know, because life kind of, I, I mean, I never planned the sort of the social media thing for myself. It sort of it grew out of all proportion um, it, unexpectedly, and I, I kind of things pull you in different directions, don't they? Opportunities arise and you go with it and, and it happens. And when I was writing the book, it was in the middle of lockdown and we had three children to homeschool and it, all that kind of thing. So there was, there's been a lot going on and what I like to do is is just go back to, okay, lots of opportunity, lots of responsibilities. What matters most in this period of my life? What's going on? What, you know, I'm a parent, I've got a business and all these other things what matters at this point and and what can I do to live in line with my values in that area of my life so you know my health is important to me uh, my children are important to me and my business is important to me but actually when everything got really busy so in the lead up to the book coming out and um and writing as well to a deadline in those periods of time I noticed actually when there weren't enough hours in the day for all of that 
um, the thing that actually fell to the wayside was exercise for me. And exercise is one of the most powerful things for me to to keep me well and like, you know, lift my mood and those sorts of things. And so I really felt the difference when I wasn't exercising. And, and I just knew, but by doing a little values check-in, which in the book I give kind of um, some little exercises and things that you can fill in to, to do it fairly easily and quickly. But essentially you kind of jot down the piece of paper, these different areas of your life, and then you note down the kind of person you want to be in that area of your life or, or the things that you that matter most to you in that area. So it might be your health or it might be long life learning or career or parenting. You know, what kind of parent do I want to be? Actually, I want to be a present one, but my work is taking me away at the moment. So how can I rejig my priorities and which decisions do I have some control over so that I can reevaluate? So it was those kind of exercises that I could do every now and then to just look at, okay, this is my life at the moment. Is it how I want it to be? If it's not, which bits can I re rejig and move about and adjust? And so it's not like these huge, um, grand life changes and big decisions. It's what could I do today? What feels manageable? What, what can I, what can I shift that would mean I feel like I'm heading in the right direction again? Um, so it's lots of little shifts, lots of small changes that if you can then maintain maintain those small changes they add up over time right yeah and I, I think with with social media with technology with just more access to information people want to go all in on everything to make these changes in their life and they forget that a lot of this takes time it's going to take building habits it's going to take like building a new normal in your life and then also accepting this reality that things aren't always going to go the way that they're playing and you have to have um, some alternative methods to fall back on when things get overwhelmed and there's something non-negotiable is kind of like what you just said like okay like no matter what I'm going to make this one shift in my life today no matter what I'm going to get outside and go for a walk no matter what I'm going to make sure I stay hydrated or spend time with my partner or whatever it is and then like you help mitigate some of the adversity that you're going through, you help mitigate some of the the stress that you're enduring because you're kind of taking your mind off that. And then also, I think you build confidence in yourself and that you know that like despite like all the the stuff you have going on, you're still taking care of yourself to some degree. I want to dive into something that we all are, I think, are struggling with right now, and that's stress. And I know there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things that can be good stress wise. There's a lot of things that can be bad. What would you say are some of the biggest misconceptions though, about stress that people have begun to believe and, um, how can they shift their mindset on that? Uh, I've, one of them that comes to mind actually is, um, something that infuriates me when I see it online is this sort of idea that, that, um, that if you're stressed, you're choosing that stress and that, you know, these kind of things that say eliminate stress from your life. And it's like, okay, how am I going to do that? You know, I've got responsibilities, I've got bills to pay and I've got children to feed and, and, you know, a sick grandma and, you know, like the, these kind of things where you kind of, most people in the world don't get to choose their stress. They have more demands on them than they have resources to face. And that is, that causes stress, right? And, and I think during the pandemic, especially, there was this kind of collective stress where everyone was kind of appreciating a bit more that the difficulties everyone was facing. Everyone kind of felt like, you know, we're in this together a little bit more than perhaps you normally do. But um, yeah, I think for me, that's one of the big sort of misconceptions around stress is that um, you can just switch it off, you know, that that um, go on a spa day or, you know live like an influencer and meditate for three hours every morning and, and life will be better. And, and no, it isn't, you know, and it's just, um, it's not really like that. I think stress pours it. I mean, I did a, a video online once where, um, trying to sort of talk about stress and I had this sort of big jar that, um, sort of plastic jar and I had a hose pipe with all the water kind of pouring into it. And I was trying to show that, you know, stress comes at you no matter what. So that the water coming out of the hose pipe was the stress pouring into your life. And, at some point, you know, everyone's only got so much capacity. So at some point that will overflow and you'll be overwhelmed with stress. And then, and then things start to unravel. And, uh, I was saying, you know, every little thing that you do that helps you to process or release stress in some way or replenish from the stress and strain, um, 
creates like a valve, a release valve. So just to be dramatic as I am, I kind of used a drill to kind of drill a hole in the side of the jar and create a release. And I said, you know, every time you exercise, it's like doing this. Or every time you meditate, it's like drilling another hole. Or every time you meet up with your friends for a coffee and just have a laugh, it's like this. Or every time you watch a comedy show, it's like this. And it's kind of all of those little things that you underestimate, but that give you a little time to replenish are like a little release valve, then none of them are the answer by themselves because they're not enough by themselves, but they work as a team, right? So if you have enough of those small things in your day and in your week on a regular basis, you find that your capacity kind of increases. It kind of feels like you can process more. You're ready to take on the next load of stress because you've got rid of the last bit and you've managed to replenish because and thing about stress as well is that you, it, it's supposed to be a short term measure. So it works really well for us. It increases your alertness so you can make decisions about whether to prioritize or not, or whether to reprioritize or not, rather. And and to do that, it kind of it needs something back. So your your brain is choosing how much energy to give to stuff, give give to the demands of your life. And, and it needs something back in the form of your nutrition or rest and replenishment. And if it doesn't get that, you're, you're running on a deficit, you know, it's, it's, it's going down, you know, you're, you're not, you're not gaining anything for what you've given out. So replenishment is the most regular replenishment is the most important part of stress management, you know, not how can I have a two week holiday every year? It's how can I put in a little bit of rest every day? How can I put in something each day that replenishes me ready to go again the next day um, so that you can maintain it over a long period of time? I, I really, really am glad that you brought up the fact that we can't just wash stress away. It doesn't just go away like that. We're always going to uh, be stressed at, at some points of our lives. I mean, it's just an, our nat- part of our natural biological process as I understand it. But there are certain things like that you can do, like we talked about the stuff you can do to prepare yourself to not have a bad day, like exercise, sleep, connection, the way you're eating that I'm sure will contribute to your, your, your stress levels throughout the day. I want to talk about, though, that something that we all have experienced or will continue to experience, and that's when we just feel stressed and our heart rate, our hearts, our heart starts racing. We start feeling like emotionally charged. We are just panicking and eventually that could you know, lead to further anxiety, panic attacks, that sort of thing. What are some of the best practice that you know of that you've used with your clients or even with yourself that when you're starting to feel those initial stages of, of stress that you can um, like stabilize your emotions and, and everything so that it, it doesn't become worse? Sure. So, I mean, I've included quite a, a whole sort of chapter in the book about um, sort of coping under pressure and how to to use stress to your advantage because that's when stress is helpful right is when you're under pressure and you need to use that increased alertness to get through and perform um so there's a lot on there but I guess the the things that I use personally include um first of all is the breathing so when you get anxious your breathing gets more shallow and it gets more rapid so it's more of a kind of (laughs) which is getting lots of extra oxygen in and and what you want to do is begin to not only slow that breathing, but you want to kind of extend your out breath. So if you do a a shorter in breath and a longer out breath, um, then you're going to kind of slow that pounding heart feeling that you can get when you're starting to really panic. And you're using, uh, it's one of the sort of quickest ways really to calm the mind is through the body, I find. And so you're kind of If you're doing a a longer out breath and a shorter in breath, so some people do that with a kind of, we used to teach people the 7-Eleven in the NHS, but it doesn't, which is a breathing in for seven, breathing out for 11, but it really doesn't have to be those numbers. It's just the main rule is that you're giving a longer out breath. Um, So I would definitely focus on um, getting a hold of my breathing if I was under lots of pressure, but also there's something else that, that I use personally, which is a kind of reframing technique. Um, that if I'm nervous about something and ex- uh, I can kind of reframe nerves to excitement. So, um, it's, it's, it's essentially the same sort of biological response happening. It's lots of the same symptoms. You know, if you're anxious, you might get your kind of clammy hands, you might be shaking and, um, you know, feel kind of jumpy and nervous and that, and that, that excitement can often feel similar to anxiety, 
But what's different is how you conceptualize it. So those same symptoms you will see as more of a positive thing if you're excited about going on holiday. But if you're focused on the nerves about flying, for example, then you might conceptualize it as an uncomfortable feeling. So it's it's slightly you know different, but enables us to to reframe the experience. So if I'm going into a, a kind of nerve wracking situation um, and I'm feeling nervous, then I know I can go down that path of telling myself why I'm nervous and all the things that could go wrong and catastrophizing about it. Or I can kind of turn that in my mind and say, um, I'm going to enjoy this. This is a, this is an opportunity. Yeah, I'm vulnerable and, and there are nerves there. But I'm also going to to enjoy it, and I, that came from an experience that I had personally when I when I was doing my clinical training. I um, we had a sort of a viva exam at the end where you go. It's like an interview exam, so you you get, walk in and there's a panel of experts, and you've got to defend your research in front of them, and and it's really kind of scary and awful, and. And the person that came out before I went in was in floods of tears. And, and you have that moment of, oh, oh gosh, what, what's going to happen here? Um, and I could feel myself getting really, really anxious about it. And, and a tutor that had worked at the university passed me and said, enjoy it. Enjoy it. It's, it's a time when people are going to take a genuine interest in what you've learned the last three years. So enjoy the chance to to show everything that you've learned. And and. I was still nervous. I still had those same physical symptoms as I walked into the exam, but I I just reframed, uh, you know, reframed into I'm excited about this one opportunity. This is a one-off experience. There was still the possibility of failure, but I felt much more able to perform because I I could tell myself that this is something that could also be enjoyable. This is just one of those weird experiences in life that feels scary but we can still go with it i don't have to ensure that i'm not scared before i have a go and and just accepting that this part of life i think helps people because i think it goes back to what i said towards the beginning of our conversation about the shame cycle of when we're starting to feel these feelings of stress anxiety and we just look at that situation in that lens in itself and we don't like reframe it like you just said and said okay like what is this situation teaching me or Maybe like something I did earlier in the day is contributing to this or what can I do different during this time to use this um, this time of my life to get better for the next. Like, There's different things obviously we can do and I love how you kind of touched on that. Um, I want to talk about anxiety because there's, there's so many people now that are sh- – struggling with not only stress, but that anxiety I'm sure is completely gone through the roof, especially in the last few years. What are you seeing in your own practice? What are you seeing online that's, if there's a few things that are common themes that, that are at the root of, of anxiety, uh, what do you think they are? Uh, well, the things that are at the root of anxiety. Um, well, it, it, genuinely, it's different for everybody. Um, some people have um, a sort of natural tendency to, um, to feel anxious about things depending on the environment they grew up in, for example. And, and they're trying to, when they're trying to address their anxiety, they're trying to turn around a lifetime of, of habits, uh, in terms of how they respond to their emotions. Um, and I mean, for other people, there's this kind of newfound anxiety where perhaps they never saw themselves as, as anxious before, but having, you know, lived through a, a global pandemic, they notice there's lots of new fears and health anxiety, for example. And, um, and, and, you know, health anxiety can be a huge deal for, for lots of people. Um, whether they're scared about their own mortality or, um, whether there's fears around a sense of responsibility as well, which is kind of, um, not new, but it's kind of a, a, a real feature of the pandemic, isn't it? Is this idea that not only are you responsible for your health, but you're responsible for other people's as well. And there's this possibility, you know, that you could pass things on to family members and things like that, which creates this absolute fear in your mind about uh, of something that you can't completely control either. You know, we can do what we can to minimize things, but we can't completely control them. So once we get our sense of responsibility over something that we don't have complete control over that's that's frightening that's really really frightening so yeah I think you know root of anxiety is is different for everybody depending on their life experience um 
I think the the things that are the same are how we then how we then deal with it. And I'd love to to get your perspective as well, like on the difference between like feeling anxious and like generalized anxiety, because I think there is, in my experience, there's a difference. So if I could just hear your kind of from your clinical background, like what that is, I think people would really get a lot out of that. Uh, Do you mean generalized anxiety disorder? Yeah, like just people who struggle with everyday anxiety versus like just feeling anxious in a certain moment. Okay. Yeah. So in my mind, you know, working in the NHS, for example, I would deal with people who had clinical levels of anxiety and, and diagnose anxiety disorders, um, which are pervasive and often severe and and enduring. Um, and when it comes to sort of clinical disorders, there are certain sets of criteria that, that a doctor would be looking were met for them to diagnose a disorder but in terms of um just sort of day-to-day anxiety anxiety is a is a normal human emotion it's a it's a feeling that we all have and so um everybody experiences that to some degree it's it's often the the severity of it and the frequency of it that varies from person to person often dependent on what they're living at that given moment. So, you know, you you could still have, we talked about the sort of people who maybe had really sort of difficult upbringings and that created um, the potential for real struggles with anxiety later on. But there's also people that don't, don't feel that they had any kind of struggles growing up, but find themselves in a really difficult position in life. You know, hard things happen and then we find ourselves overwhelmed and then and then you can experience anxiety that way. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it is not in my mind, it's not in boxes. It's more of a spectrum that we're all moving up and down every day. And the more we look after our health and our well-being, the more that um, we're going to be on the lower end of that kind of severity scale, I think. If that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I, I like, yeah, yeah, it totally makes sense. And I think it, you're right. I think it is a spectrum. I think we're all going to fall on that line, depending on the way we grew up, depending on our level of self-awareness, depending on how we take care of ourselves on a daily basis, depending on like where we're at at that point in our lives. I think it's all going to play a, a massive role in we, where we are on that spectrum. I want to talk about managing anxiety because I think the way a lot of bad habits form is because of the mismanagement of their emotions, the mismanagement of things like anxiety and depression. So I know you talked about the importance of reframing situations when it comes to managing stress is the way that people should handle days of anxiety or days where they're constantly feeling anxious the same, or is there some differences? Okay. So when it comes to anxiety, because it's a, one of those normal things, a normal part of being human, it's not something we can eradicate. It's something that we can um, uh, perceive in a different way and we can and we can respond to it in a different way. So often with anxiety, anxiety tells you to do the things that are going to keep you stuck. In, just, in the same way that low mood does, anxiety will tell you to um, avoid the thing that's making you anxious and escape it so if i don't know if you're in a supermarket and and you have a rush of anxiety and panic anxiety will tell you to get out of there and don't go back for as long as possible and that helps you to feel better in the short term but in the longer term that will keep anxiety going so anxiety by recognizing the anxious feeling as as normal but not always an accurate reflection of whether you're safe or not um, you can then make your own judgment. So by, by understanding anxiety as part of your alarm system. So I always, in some of my videos, I've talked about it as a kind of smoke alarm that it's, okay, it's your threat system, but essentially your threat system is guessing. Like it only has certain information about what's going on in your surroundings and it's, it's function is to keep you safe. So any warning signs at all, 
and it could fire off or even not even warning signs but anything that um is going on in your body that that mimics anxiety so maybe you're maybe you drunk too much coffee today and then your heart is pounding and your brain goes well hang on a minute something's going on and so it can trigger off that anxiety response because it's making a best guess it's saying not all is okay so let's do something about it and so in in a way the kind of the smoke alarm analogy is a kind of yeah yeah it goes off when there's a fire but it can also go off when someone's burning the toast you know so um your job is to experience that anxiety as the alarm system and then decide what is the best thing to do now like is someone burning the toast or am I at risk and and then what should I do about it so it kind of changing your relationship with the anxiety in terms of not accepting it as the truth immediately but taking seeing it as information so taking some time then to work out okay what what can I do now with this feeling it's really uncomfortable it's trying to tell me something is it warranted is it is it accurate reflection of what's going on around me so what do I do next so that you can then choose to make your decisions based on what you know is best for you as opposed to making all your decisions based on anxiety or fear um, because the anxiety will tell you to do things that are going to make you feel better now, not the things that are going to make you feel better in the long run. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 so true that you, you have to use your emotions and your feelings and what's going on inside of your body as a signal to what you have to do next. And I think so many people are going to get a lot out of the fact that you have to kind of be aware of that. And then also like take the right actions to, to help kind of mitigate that and know that you're just not going to push anxiety completely away forever. Like it's going to be there, like, and it's normal. And if you experience financial hardship, you're going to feel anxious. If you get into a fight with your partner, I'm sure you'll feel anxious. If you don't sleep well, you might wake up feeling anxious. You mentioned drinking too much caffeine. You're going to feel anxious. So I love that you touched on that. I want to talk about something that's like a, a close sibling to anxiety and that's fear. So if you could for for a second like talk about like the main differences between anxiety and fear and then also how they go together. I think there's no kind of um major differences in terms of like the, the physiological response is the same. Uh, we only have that one alarm system. It's how we conceptualize it is different. So I guess anxiety would be I would say anxiety we conceptualize different from stress because it has an element of fear in it or something that is threatening but then when we talk about fear we talk about that in terms of it seems more um intense and overwhelming you know you can kind of function with a degree of anxiety throughout the day perhaps but when people talk about fear they tend to talk about you know I felt fear when I watched a horror movie you know when I was overwhelmed with that rush of fear and often um it's just about the the different ways of concept, conceptualizing it. And sometimes that's where there's so much crossover because people use the terms interchangeably to mean slightly different things and don't always kind of explain those differences. So, so actually fear and anxiety sometimes mean different things to different people or the same thing to different people. So um, uh, yeah, they're both from the same sort of biological experience but we sometimes attach them to different types of situations to mean slightly different things. Yeah, they, they are very interchangeable, right? Because they both kind of go hand in hand. Like a lot of times we'll start to feel anxious because of a fear that we're having. And then that could be the feeling of anxiety can create more fear because you're like, oh my gosh, am I going to feel like this forever? Or like, is this ever going to go away? And that sort of thing. I, I want to talk about, before we get into like how to healthily face your fears, because I think that's something that people tend to struggle with. I want to talk about some some things that maybe are online or some things that you've seen um, on social media that people say work to help uh, somebody feel less anxious that are just blatantly false. Yeah. I've seen a few sort of, um, you know, ads and things out there of uh, random kind of items that you can buy that will eliminate anxiety and stuff. And, and you know, anything that says it will eliminate anxiety is probably, probably not accurate because okay being anxious um occasionally at least is a part of being human you know and um and if you're doing things that make you anxious you're probably doing things right because you're kind of growing and and develop it you know if you're for example if you're trying to be more confident then you need to do things that 
initially make you feel anxious before you get confident at doing them and stuff like that so the way that you develop confidence in different areas is to to be able to sit with anxiety while you're getting better at that thing whatever it is um so uh, yeah i mean it's 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 different for everybody right right the common theme that i'm hearing from you is that there is no one size fits all approach when it comes to things like managing stress anxiety that sort of thing and there's not going to be anything that's going to completely make anxiety or stress go away forever because we need those things to survive like they're survival mechanisms for us i want to get into facing fears because there's there's so many people that they get anxious when they they think about facing a fear it could be asking somebody out on a date it could be going to the gym for the first time. It could be going to somebody's house for dinner that you haven't seen in a long time. So what are some some easy first steps that, that somebody can take to help them face their fear in a way that's going to move them closer towards that and not further away? Sure. So, um, I mean, I talk about this in the book, actually, about my own experiences, because I, I grew up um, with a fear of heights. And um, the thing is about fear of heights is that you don't really get many opportunities to face it unless maybe you live in a big city and work or live up a big tower. And and, and I did neither of those. So um, the only times I would ever really face it was when I went on holiday or something or at some kind of tourist destination and, and that kind of thing. And um, so I've included in the book actually a few of the experiences where I was perhaps pre-clinical training and got it wrong, you know, did the wrong thing where I would I would sort of be in a situation where that, that fear was so powerful and so strong. And the main thing I tried to do was make it go away as quickly as possible. So, um, I, you know, I went to Italy and I went to the, the Leaning Tower of Pisa and kind of got to the top and it, and hit the floor. I just sat on the floor <laughs> and looked at the floor to try and convince my body that I was not up high, you know, just to try and make the anxiety go away and um, make it better. And actually, uh, in the book, I talk about how what I would do differently now is um, a take my time sort of going up to the top and b not avoid experiencing being up high not try and make it all go away acknowledge that fear is uncomfortable but it is essentially a safe like my, my body's sort of doing what it's supposed to do um, and and allow my body use my breather use the slow breathing to kind of work through it and stay with it for as long as I could possibly manage until the fear came down because the way that your brain learns is like a scientist it's through experience and evidence so in order to find out that something is actually safe uh, your brain wants lots of evidence for it so you gotta you know if I was trying to be okay with being up high maybe and I would I would go up there every day for a period of time and I would stay there until I didn't feel so anxious so over time it feels like your your anxiety is just going to keep going up and up and up and up and up and you're going to kind of implode in some way and and actually what happens is it levels out at a certain part really really uncomfortable place but it levels out and then your body exhausts itself so it starts to come back down gradually 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 and and if you can stay in the feared situation as your body calms and and if you can when you eventually leave that feared situation if you are then not feeling as anxious as when you started your brain kind of clocks that as an experience of well, we survived it. Whereas if you go into a feared situation, your anxiety is at its highest and then you immediately escape. You get this like, phew, thank goodness. And your brain clocks that as like, wow, not doing that again because that was unsafe. Um, and so you have to kind of be in that situation, see it go well for your brain to experience it as, as a safe situation. But your brain needs to do that on repeat. So you've got to do it as many times as you can. So often if we're kind of dealing with phobias and and fears with people in therapy, we would create what's called a kind of um, a, a, a graded exposure list. So you would kind of you don't have to flood yourself with a really awful, you know, you don't start on the Empire State Building. You you start with something that feels manageable. You know, you, you do something that triggers that fear response, but something you feel like you could manage. And then you keep doing that and you repeat it, repeat it, repeat it until it kind of becomes easy so your your comfort zone grows and that becomes oh, that's not so bad anymore actually I've done it 10 times I'm all right with it now and then you take the next thing on the list and then the next thing on the list and you just gradually 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 expand that 
uh, comfort zone by by repeating. So the thing that you do every day becomes your comfort zone. So, you know, keep repeating that thing using those other skills to manage the anxiety while you're there. So the slow breathing, get someone to support you doing it, those kind of things, or maybe even, you know, access a therapist that can help you to kind of work through the graded exposure. Um, and, and, and then trust the process that, that if you kind of put all these things in place, um, you can then convince your brain that actually this situation is a safe one. You have to train your brain. You're absolutely right. And if you are in a situation that, it potentially scares you like, you know, I'll just use the easy example of let's just say you're going to ask a stranger out in a grocery store and you're like, oh, this is too scary. Then you're going to train your brain. That situation's scary. And then what's going to happen the next time you think about doing it? Ah, my brain is telling me I'm scared. Then you never do it. But if you end up like leaning into that fear and I've, I've had this own fear. I was somebody that was terrified of like asking somebody out in public. If you lean into that fear and the worst thing that happens is the person's just not interested. You feel so much better. Not, I mean, not necessarily because they weren't interested, but you're like, wow, that wasn't nearly as scary as I thought. Cause I think what happens is a lot of times the fear of the outcome becomes way bigger than the fear itself. Like what's going to happen? Like when we do this versus like what's actually going on here. And that's why I think it's so crucial. Like you said, to use some of these anxiety management tools to kind of calm your nervous system down, kind of keep yourself in this best logical state as you can so that you don't get hyper emotional when you are trying to navigate through this. And I think when it comes to emotions, a lot of people love feeling the good ones. They don't like feeling the bad ones. And I think in my own experience, when I completely try and push the bad ones away, they catch up with me over time. And I can see it affecting other areas of my life that the emotions weren't necessarily directly involved in. So I know you talk about this in the book. What if, so what are some of your best tips for people that, you know, let's just say right now they're, they're experiencing um, some negative emotions or maybe some for somebody who will experience negative emotions in the future, which we all will. Like how can they like use that to their advantage to um, grow into a better version of themselves? I think um, something that um, I came across when I was in clinical training that felt quite transformative for me personally was the idea that you could welcome every emotion like what that you know some emotions can be excruciating and unbearable but this idea that that it's all experiences and it's all sensation and and they all pass they're all temporary they all come and they all go and they and something else comes and then goes and and see, so the idea that you could welcome it all as a part of life takes some of the fear and the power out of those negative emotions. You know, I mean, some people find um, almost a kind of um, a beautiful kind of poetry and sadness, for example, and and it's still it's still an uncomfortable emotion. But if we welcome it and we allow it to be there, what happens is it takes its natural course. Like you said, if you try not to feel something, it catches up with you. It doesn't go anywhere. It still needs to be processed. And and if we allow ourselves to do that, I mean, I talk in, in one of my videos, um, he's a, um, a metaphor that I often use in therapy about emotion and holding it back. As if you imagine you're stood in the ocean up to kind of maybe chest height and the waves are sort of coming past you and they need to get past you to hit the shore. If you... If you tell yourself that you are not going to let those waves pass you and you're going to kind of resist them, then you're going to take a tumble and you're going to end up, you know, with mouthfuls of water and, and it's not going to go well. But the waves essentially will get to the shore no matter what. But if you if you recognize that those waves need to pass and you need just need to look after yourself while they pass, then it changes. You're not resisting. Actually, you end up kind of bracing yourself. Maybe you're kind of bend your knees and be ready for a little, you know, maybe you still get lifted off your feet a bit, but you're not going to take a tumble and lose complete control. What you do is you kind of brace yourself. You allow it to pass naturally and then it does. And you can kind of land back on your feet again. And I think it's that way with emotion. If we focus not on pushing it away and avoiding it, but if we focus on looking after ourselves through it, because some of them are really, really painful, um, then we can allow them to take their natural course. So 
I often talk to people about focusing on self-soothing. So, you know, if, if a, an emotion is painful, focus on doing the things that help you to feel safe and soothed as that emotion is passing um, so rather than blocking. So it's very different. It's I'm going to allow myself to feel that and I'm going to look after myself while I'm feeling it because it's really hard and then it will pass. Processing emotions is so important and using these these proper tools and able to, to be able to do so is a game changer. Because I think in my, I'm just speaking from my own personal experience, and I'm sure people listening to this have gone through this, where if they think, oh, I'm just not going to think about it, that means I'm processing it. Like, that means I'm over it if I'm not thinking about it. But you haven't really done the work to process <laughs> that knot of sadness, that knot of guilt, anger, shame, like whatever no negative emotion it is. And then the next time it just continues to build and build and build. And then you have this crazy outburst, you know, which I've had where you like wonder like why at the slightest thing is this impacting me in such a negative way. And then you have to kind of trace it back to this very thing of my own inability to not to continue to sweep my, my, my own inability to not sweep things under the rug and face them head on when I'm experiencing them so that I can get better at managing my emotions moving forward. And then also that impacts my relationships in a more positive way. And and I wanted to thank you for coming on here and just sharing so openly, Dr. Julie. I mean, we unpacked so much between fear, anxiety, stress, emotions, how to get out of a, of a dark day. Like we talked about it all. And I think so many people are going to get a lot out of this. I think a lot of people are going to want to buy your book. So if people want to connect with you and they want to learn more about what you have going on, they want to check out your videos, like where's the best place for them to do that? Yeah, probably um, Instagram, you know, everything goes on. I've got daily content going on Instagram. It was all kind of snippets and insights from therapy and stuff like that. But um, and I guess the book um, has the details. So the book has those step by steps of, you know, it, and I've, I've deliberately kind of separated it into those kind of human problems that we all face, your kind of your motivation problems or low mood days or grief or those kind of things that we all face at different times. So that you don't have to read the thing cover to cover because that's, you know, most people don't do that, right? You, you want to dip in, find the stuff you're looking for and then get out again. So I've kind of done that with it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, either the book or come over to Instagram and then and then get some free content as well. You know, the kind of there's lots there. Um, and yeah, come join the community. Amazing. Well, I will make sure to include the link to buy your book and where to follow you on social media in the show notes. And for those listening, like I always try to encourage you to do, what I'd like you to do is share a takeaway. Maybe it was something that Dr. Julie said about misconceptions about stress. Maybe it was something we talked about with, with regards to handling anxiety. Maybe it was something that she said about emotions, fear, uh, how to get out of a dark place, whatever it was. Tag, her, tag Dr. Julie and tag myself because we'd love to hear your feedback. And we once again thank you for listening to this episode of The Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst. We'll see you next time.